intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on mentors and motivators who are consistently reshaping, redefining, and rediscovering the field of medical health care. I would like to welcome Dr. David Agus, a professor of medicine and engineering at the University of Southern California and a number one New York Times bestselling author. For over two decades, Dr. Agus has helped shape innovative technologies in medicine and often contributes to CBS News on public health issues. Good morning, Dr. Agus. Good morning. Thank you so much for spending a few moments with us today. I just want to find out about your background and, you know, prior to you receiving your MD and then what motivates you and inspires you and to do what you do and, and to send the messages out that you do. So. so what initially motivated you to become a physician? My father was a physician. Okay. And when I was a kid, I always wanted to be in the lab. And so I went to various programs across the country to study in the lab. So other kids were at camp. I was working in the lab. I was a geek. And I published my first paper at age 13. And so as, as a young kid, I wanted to make a difference. It was about how to modulate and control the immune system. At 13? So at 13. We had one of the first you know, experiments on the space shuttle. I was you know, one of those kids who just got totally excited by science and wanted to do it. That's unbelievable. What kind of physician was your father? He's a kidney doctor. Is, okay. That's wonderful. And you grew up in the Northeast? I grew up, I uh, uh, was born in Baltimore. Okay. And then my father was drafted into the Air Force, and we lived in San Antonio, Texas, and then moved back to Philadelphia. And he was a professor at University of Pennsylvania for years, and so grew up outside Philadelphia. Did, other than your father, did you have an influence early on in life? You know, I mean, I, I was the kid who I would read biographies all the time. I would, you know, study other scientists. And so early on, um, you know, one of the people that really got me excited turned out to be a, me a mentor of mine later in life was Andy Grove. So Andy was the guy who founded Intel. Oh. And so, you know, the, the, the microprocessors, Intel inside in every computer. And Andy was a Holocaust survivor who went and really became one of the, 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 the beacons of Silicon Valley. And later on, I evolved to, you know, being involved in his care. And he became a real mentor to me and was one of the big reasons I moved from the East Coast to the West Coast. So... You went to medical school. You went to college. You studied... Yes. I studied molecular biology and public policy at Princeton. Wow. What a diverse combination. Okay. Yeah. It was the you know, first year they had molecular biology. You could become biology. your own lobbyist. <laughs> you know, if you think about it, you know, at the time, molecular biology was the beginning. So this was the first year molecular biology existed. I was one of the first majors wow. in it. And the idea in public policy, I had spent so much time in the lab. I wanted to know how to get things done. And so you know, it really changed my life. It's given me a broader view on things. And the medical school? At University of Pennsylvania. Okay. And you did your, your uh, residency? And I sp then took some time between medical school and residency at the National Institutes of Health. Okay. So I spent two years there working in the lab and then went to Johns Hopkins and did internship <laughs> and residency in Baltimore and then went to Sloan Kettering okay. to train in cancer. Did you have an inspiration as to why you wanted to go into cancer? You know, I wanted to be in a field that I could take things from the lab and bring it to the patient. You know, I didn't want to just work in the lab, and I didn't want to just see patients. I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to change something. And cancer is one of those areas where literally patients are willing to take the risk, you're willing to take the risk. You know, it was a field that was just beginning. In fact, I remember at Hopkins talking to the head of Hopkins and saying, listen, I'm going to go to Sloan Kettering after Hopkins. He goes, that's career suicide. Wow. He said, y you know, cancer is just giving toxins to people. You're smart going to cardiology or pulmonary where you can make a difference. And it kind of made my resolve even stronger. Is to prove know, him wrong? Well, no, it's the old Wayne Gretzky okay. quote is you go not to where the puck is, to right. where it's going to be. And so this was a field where there wasn't much to do, but all of a sudden technology was coming to a head, right? All of a sudden we could sequence DNA. We can look inside the cell at all these things. And so to apply that to cancer got me excited. So fast forward to today. You're married. Yes. You have... Two children? Yes, How two old children. Are they? they are 16 and 18, a daughter okay. who's freshman in college and a son who's a junior in high school. So what brings you the greatest satisfaction today, both personally and professionally? Well, I mean, it's family. It's spending time with my wife and kids, um, you know, every day is certainly a privilege, and that is to help people. You know, I get to treat people. They put their lives in my hands, and I can help them hopefully live longer 
and better. And it's a privilege. And unfortunately, we don't win a lot in that many times people die of cancer. But if I can make them ease their suffering or make them live longer or better, I've done a good thing. How do you wrap your arms around it when you know when somebody first comes to see you that you can't give them any hope? Well, I can always give them hope. Um, okay. You know, in today's era, I can always give them hope and make them, you know, even if not live longer, live better. And so we've, you know, I'm a believer in the technology and the new things that are happening now, and we can make a difference. You know, I make a deal with patients of mine, which is somewhat of a morbid deal, but, you know, I want to do their autopsies. I want to learn where mm -hmm. I went wrong and to get better. And sometimes you've taken care of these people for two decades, and you're very close to them, and they're friends, but it's the only way I can improve. And so, you know, at the same time, you know, I will do anything to try to make them live better. You know, whether it be sequencing the DNA of their cancer, whether it be pushing the FDA for a new drug, you know, we have to push. We're at war. Um, we're literally at war. Do you prefer to be with the patient or in the lab room? You know, I think it's both. I mean, the lab is hope. I make people who work in my lab um, come and see patients with me because to the patient, they're hope personified. Wow. And it gets very exciting. They, you know, that patient looks and goes, that's my hope. And that kid in the lab, or just the kid, that person in the lab, when they come to see the patient, they don't go home that night. They go back to the lab and stay there all night to try to make a difference. And so it's a privilege to be in that, you know, in the marriage between them. Because what I do, we're good at, but we're not great. We have to get better. And so if I don't have a lab and be able to do that, I, I'm not making the field move forward. My job is not to treat cancer, it's to change how we treat cancer. I have to tell you, I'm sitting here still looking at that 13-year-old boy who is so unbelievably fascinated right. with biology. And that is emanating, and it's really, it, it's oozing out of every pore. It is a beautiful, beautiful, I mean, I, to sit here and yeah. listen to you and, and see your, your, you know, your affect, and it's, um, it, it's really quite inspiring, I have to tell you. Well, thank you. I mean, it's a privilege. I mean, you, you know, to work on things that can help people. One of the drugs that we worked in our lab is now FDA approved in treating women with breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And every time you see it, you just get you know, goosebumps saying, listen, I was involved in making this. Um, but yeah, and every person who works for us, they're heroes. I mean, as are the patients. And we're all working to try to make a difference. How many days a week are you able to see patients? I see patients two or three days a week and see a relatively large number on those days. I have a remarkable team that's been with me for a lot of years. And so we're pretty good at that. Some patients may need five minutes of my time. Others may need an hour. Um, but, you know, we have to push. And it's getting to cheat, right? If I were in the lab without seeing patients, I would not be nearly as good. So I get to cheat every day by looking at disease, smelling disease. You know, we're building this new institute in L.A. because I want all researchers to be able to be with patients. And so there'll be residences. So the greatest thinkers, math, physics, engineering, will live there for months at a time and be able to sit there with a the patient sit there with a pathologist, sit there with a surgeon or a radiologist to actually get to live and breathe the diseases we study. And in your spare time, you're also teaching? Yes. And so. you teach engineering as well? I'm a professor of medicine okay. and engineering at the University of Southern okay. California. And yeah, I mean, so I want, you know, we were taught in high school, there's biology, there's chemistry, okay. there's physics. Well, this is a new era. We call it convergence, where they all come together. It's artificial that we put them in different buckets. So the idea is bring disciplines together. You know, almost by definition, the biologists who've studied cancer historically, well, we didn't solve the problem. So we need new ways of thinking. You know, Walter Isaacson, who's a remarkable guy who wrote the book on Steve Jobs and others, you know, uh, arranged for an interview with me once where uh, a Murray Gelman, who's probably the greatest living physicist, was going to interview me. Murray discovered the quark and string theory. Murray won the Nobel Prize in 1969 when I was four. Wow. So we sat there on stage, and the smartest guy in the room, literally in the world, you sit there, first thing you have to ask is, did you know Einstein? He said, you know, I was at a bar once and we had a drink and we argued about this. I'm like, you got in a bar fight with Einstein? Um, and that's but he the was next book. <laughs> asking me these questions in a different way and looking at cancer and wellness in a way that I had never done before. And so he was saying, you know, in physics, we look at the outliers and that's how we learn everything. Well, in my field, we look in the middle, never at the outliers. And he kept pushing me. It was a remarkable interview. The wildest part was this guy, the smartest guy in the world, you know, would ask his question. Underneath every question he wrote in capital letters, remember to smile. So he would ask a question and then go. 
Um, Inappropriate to the question, I'm <laughs> sure, right. He was, you know, and now, and since that interview, we've worked together, you know, every year, and he joined our faculty working together oh, thinking about wonderful cancer. wonderful story. And so it's such a privilege to be able to push and think differently and to approach the problem in a different way. Which brings me to the discussion of integrative or functional or personalized medicine. Yes. What is your definition of that? Well, you know, I started off as a cancer doctor and then realized that, you know, when I push patients to the edge of the cliff and pull them back, I'm learning a lot about the whole system. And so the books we've written are about wellness and general health, not really about cancer. And so the notion of treating every patient and individual is very powerful. In many respects, I think we got it all wrong. You know, in the 1920s, there was an experiment done that screwed up medicine for the next 90 years. They took people with a large cut on their leg, and they took a piece of bread, they dipped it in water, and they wrapped it around the leg. Well, the people with the moist bread on their leg healed twice as fast as the people where they left the cut open to the air. Right? The bread made mold, the mold made penicillin, and it spawned something called germ theory. Germ theory said, as soon as you know what you're up against, you know exactly how to fix it. I know that bacteria. I know exactly what antibiotic to give. And it was right. The problem is human disease isn't from without, it's from within. It's the body intersecting with itself. It's like if you're going to drive from Vegas, where we are now, to Los Angeles, you take apart a car and look at every piece. It doesn't tell you how long it takes to get there. You forgot the weather, the traffic, the bladder size of the driver, how much caffeine the driver made, drank. They all matter. Well, in medicine, we keep taking apart the car. And so there's an experiment done where they looked at the, the eyelids. It's the only part of the body you don't classically put sunscreen on. And in 100 people, every mutational change of cancer was there, yet none of them had cancer. Because in order to get cancer, you need the DNA to change, but you also need a receptive environment. So in my field, we keep talking about the cell and the gene, and in every field, and we forget the environment. We forget that we are what we call a complex system. And so it's a radically new way of thinking, personalized medicine, not just about what is your DNA code, but thinking of your system as a whole. And it's a new way of approaching both wellness and disease. So you are about to deliver a keynote address to yes. a few thousand of your constituents. What do you hope that would be the biggest impact of your message this morning? You know, I want to push them. I mean, I want to push them to think differently and to question things. Because much of what we do in medicine, we don't question. Much of what we do in medicine, we just do. And I want them to question the data whether it be taking a pill, a supplement, or a procedure they do, I want them to ask every time, where's the data? Does it make sense? You know, a study came out three years ago that was fascinating. You know, it really built on decades of knowledge. In that 1950s, this Russian explorer went to Antarctica. He was a doctor. Well, he got appendicitis. And there's an amazing picture. It's in my new book about him taking his own appendix out. He did surgery on himself, because we are taught 24-7 appendicitis Russian take that appendix out. Well, in Europe, they did studies where they gave antibiotics to people with appendicitis. Well, when they did that, almost 70% of people didn't need surgery at all, and 30% went to surgery but had no excess complications. And, you know, in the United States, you know, last year, there were about 300,000 of these procedures done. And so what's amazing is now, several years later, we're still doing the same amount. We could save over 200,000 surgeries a year. We just don't question it. And whether it be people taking vitamins and supplements, you know, we spend more on vitamins and supplements in our country than we do in all of medical research. Hmm. Yet there's yet to be a study in the history of man or womankind of them showing a benefit. You had some controversy. I know that there's been some backlash or, or criticism, or maybe not criticism, but in your book, The End of Illness, right. you talk about is it beneficial to take supplements, and mm -hmm. it can be, in fact, harmful. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on that? Well, I mean, it's not controversial. That's the okay. data. Right? Again, there's yet to be a positive study with a supplement in a normal individual in the history of man or womankind. Yet at the same time, there's lots of data that can cause side effects or problems. Men who take vitamin E, and this is a large study that cost over $240 million to do by the government, after year three they had to stop it because there was a 70% increase in prostate cancer in the men who took the vitamin E. Elderly women over the age of 70 take high dose vitamin D, a 26% increase in the rate of bone fractures, not decrease. And you can go through study by study, never shown a benefit and potential real side effects. And so I look at it and say, listen, I'm not against vitamin supplements, but I'm against anything where there's no data. Are the side effects or are the complications because it's interacting with a medication that they're on? Or is it no, most of the time, you know, our body's homeostatic. So if I give you a large dose of vitamin D, 
you downregulate the sensor or the receptor, you actually screw up signaling. You know, we should have known this from nature, right? Our body evolved a very complex mechanism so we don't get too much vitamin D at once. It's called tanning. The reason we tan is got too much vitamin D isn't good for us. Yet we go, we take it in this pill, right? All of vitamin D. But is, are we just taking too much? Well, I mean, you don't have scurvy, you don't have rickets, you don't have beriberi. I guarantee you, we don't see it in this country. And that's what a vitamin deficiency is. All a vitamin is, is something the body can't synthesize enough of. It doesn't mean more is better. There's this magic, you know, thing. Well, more vitamins are better and they fight disease. Well, but there's no data to that effect. And so, listen, I'm not controversial. I'm conservative. And I'm just saying, I don't want you to do something, pharmacologic amounts of a medicine, without data. And these are medicines. How about omega-3s? Well, omega-3s, you know, it's very s simple. Is that there have now been multiple studies with fish oil supplementation or omega-3 supplementation. And when you look at the data, no benefit at all, ever, heart disease, cancer, or any disorder. At the same time, there's significant side effects with many of them. So again, I look at it and say, well, it's really interesting, but does it make sense? You know, your body creates free radicals, for example, to get rid of bad, damaged cells. When you take high dose of these antioxidants, you block that natural process. It doesn't even make scientific sense why they would benefit. So why are we doing it? Oh, boy. Okay. So in all of your years of practicing medicine, mm -hmm. now a New York Times best-selling author, a few times over, have you had any regrets along the way, any paths that you wished you had taken or didn't take? You, you know, sure. Um, you know, to evolve to where you are, you know, you make a lot of wrong turns. Um, you know, so in my case, um, you know, certainly I wish I got involved in patient care more earlier on. And so earlier on, I spent a lot of time in the lab, and I loved it, um, but I wish I had known more at the time, and I think I could have impacted more. And so it's a funny thing in science. If you look at the great discoveries, almost all of them happen when people are young. So their 20s, their 30s. Very few happen when you're 40 and 50. You know, the sad part is I think I know a lot more now than I did then. If I had that knowledge then, it would have been uh, much more powerful. And, you know, you always look back and say, I think we all do. I wish I studied more. Right. I wish I did more. You know, what's, what I want to try to push my kids at, the role of university is not to learn a profession. It's to learn how to think. So I wish I took more art classes, more philosophy, more history, and not as much on the science side, because I'm pretty good at the science side. I wish I'd learn more of the other side, and I think I would have been a broader thinking scientist going forward. Do you have any hobbies? Um, I play tennis with the kids, and I love it. I mean, so it's something we could do as a family. It's something I could do, hopefully, till late in life. Um, you know, I have uh, an old antique car that we tinker around with, my son and I. So a 1965 Jaguar, and oh, it's fun. The cars fun. back then were simple. What color? Um, so it's black on black. It's beautiful. a convertible Jaguar XKE. It's a beautiful car, but it's fun to kind of play around with and look at it. And then we collect wine, which I love. You know, to me, drinking a glass of wine, the year it's from, you're drinking history. So drinking, you think about what happened that year, the wine or the grapes were born. And it's a very powerful, exciting thing to me. You touched on it, but can you elaborate as to why this particular field of medicine, the integrative and the functional, is important to you? Here, to me, the real big advances in medicine are going to be a holistic view, is looking at the body as a whole system. We've looked organ by organ, cell by cell, at DNA, and the really next frontier in medicine is to tie it all together, to look at the whole. And I think that's going to be very powerful. And so, you know, much of this is, I don't even know how to describe it. How do I describe your system? I'm good at describing DNA. I'm good at describing cancer versus normal. But how do I describe everything else? And so to me, that's going to be the next frontier. And so fields of medicine that look at that broad part, to me, are exciting. And I think it's going to create a whole new vocabulary. Are they implementing this into the Keck School of Medicine program? You know, unfortunately, medical schools teach for tests. Medical schools, and it, to me, it's just crazy. You know, we get kids who do well in aptitude tests, do well in scores. We put them into medical school. We make them memorize things, and then we throw them out into the world. Right. Well, today's world, you can get anything you want in your smartphone. Do you want a doctor who can think and have the art of medicine or one who can remember the dose in a formula? I want that doctor to look up the dose in the formula and be able to look at the, the patient as a whole, to have that sense of observation, to actually look and say, how are they sitting? How is the... Or the veins, be, to look at that hole and have the, the art of it. 
And unfortunately, we're moving away from it, more to the science of it, to the formulas of it, to the memorization. I want to go back the other direction. You know, William Osler was the father of American medicine. And, you know, he changed medicine because at the time, you know, we doctors all sat in a room and talked about the science and the theory. And he said, listen, we have to talk about the patient in front of the patient. So grand rounds at Hopkins, where they have their big meeting, they have the patient in the room. They don't talk about the patient with him or her not being there. They have them there so they can ask them questions and they're involved. And we have to go back to that. It's a relationship. It's being able to speak. Well, Osler was also very famous because he had three daughters. And he was famous because he developed a special handshake to his daughter's suitors like this. <laughs> I'll break your arm. <laughs> no, it's because oh. back then we didn't have a way to treat syphilis. And when you got syphilis, oh. you developed lymph nodes right here. So he would feel for so the So he was lymph checking his daughter's suitors to see if they had syphilis. <laughs> That's By funny. the way, there were no lymph nodes oh, in your well, arm. Oh, thank God. Okay. So where do you hope that medicine will be? And to that point, where the teaching of medicine will be to the future doctors of America in 10 years? You know, we see a lot about the Watsons of the world or artificial intelligence and medicine, and it does scare me. To me, medicine is an art, and there's a science component to it, and it's marrying the two. You know, there's a great story where they put 10 Rembrandt experts in the room, and they put 10 paintings on the wall. Nine were real, one was a fake. They all looked at them and they said, real, real, fake, real, and they got it right. And they said to these experts, why is that real and that fake? And they couldn't tell them. Because the human brain is amazing. It pulls together so many different aspects and puts a hierarchy to make your decisions. There's an art to it. You see thousands of patients, you get good at it. So my hope is we don't lose that art. My hope is we keep selecting kids who majored in philosophy and art history and you know languages in college and not just the science geek you know to the geeks to me it's a marriage of them you want some science people some art people some history and that's where in medical school you can get the discourse to really bring new levels of understanding does the admissions committee at usc follow that same philosophy i don't think they do in any medical school right. and i think you're okay. seeing medical schools saying listen maybe we should get rid of requirements you know that they actually have history and let them just study in science at an early age you know, much of the innovation in the world happens here in the United States, and it's because we have a broad education system. In Europe, they cho choose the profession right out of high school. And I think that broad education system is what allows us to think and really to be entrepreneurs, to be innovative, to think differently. And if we lose that, I get worried. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? You know, I, I, I'm shocked by the impact you can have by writing, whether it be for the New York Times or writing a book. You know, the amount of people who read it really worldwide to me has been astonishing. And so I want to continue to do that and to impact. You know, my job is to push. You know, it's to change medicine. And so, uh, you know, I continue doing the CBS morning show once or twice a week because I can push millions of people at a time. I'm not a reporter. I get to say whatever I want. I could say, this makes sense. This doesn't make sense. Because in order to get normative behavior change, you need leadership. And we're lacking leadership in medicine. So it's our obligation, it's our job to get out there and push and to teach at the undergraduate level, at the medical school level, and at the broad level to really push people. Your children, do they have an interest in medicine? Not at all. Engineering? <laughs> both of them, yeah. Both of them have, you know, my daughter's an engineer. Oh, She's studying wow. applied math in college, which Wonderful. I love. You know, my son also wants to be an engineer. Both of them love science and math. Um, but I think the medicine sky, they steered away from. You know, medicine is, I mean, it's a privilege to do, but, you know, I'm called every single night. I'm called on my cell phone from a patient, you know, 24-7, seven days a week, and it's hard. And, you know, it takes a certain personality to be able to do that nonstop. And I think my kids love the science part, and, the, and they have a passion for science and math, and they'll pursue that, and who knows if they'll go into medicine or not. They've got years to make their decision. Okay, so here's a couple of fun questions for you. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, what was the last book that you read for enjoyment? It's called The Hidden Life of Trees. It is the coolest book ever. It was written by a German, translated to English, and it became a New York Times bestseller. And he wasn't really a scientist. He managed a forest in Germany. And it's about how trees communicate, talk to each other, and learn from each other. You know, we can learn so much from their worlds to apply to our world. You know, there's an amazing time-lapse video where they put a pole in the ground, and there are two vines, and both of them seek it, and they go like this over time. One of them grabs on, the other goes like this, and then goes away, and then withers away and dies. Because it realizes that only one can survive hooked to the pole. 
And so they communicate. They do it through funguses and bacteria in the soil. They can actually listen and potentially make noise. And it was a tremendous book to me to open my eyes to something I knew nothing about. Fascinating. How about other books that your peers might have written? Um, there's a, a great book written by a historian called Sapiens that looks at the evolution of the human brain from the eyes of a historian. You know, all too often I read things by other biologists and molecular biologists, but to see something writ written about our field by somebody with a different perspective was very powerful. And again, it taught me to think differently, how I can take the same data and maybe interpret it differently. And it's a beautiful book. Do your kids celebrate Halloween? Um, they celebrate <laughs> until really this year, you know, at 16 and 18. Um, although my son and his friends made a haunted house of their friends for the kids in the neighborhood. Um, but yeah, for years we would go to one great party that our friends had and all dress up as a family and it was fun. Do you pass out candy and junk food and whatnot to your um, neighbors? Where we live, we're up a big hill, oh, okay. so unfortunately it's we're not going to passing out. But this party we all enjoyed. We okay. got dressed up every year. It was fun. <laughs> what was your favorite costume? Well, we were the Flintstones. Oh, and which, uh, were you Fred? Or? I was Fred. Okay. Yeah. Very cute. So what was the one food that you ate as a child that you would never allow your children to eat? Um, you know, I, I grew up outside of Philadelphia, and so we had these uh, hostess uh, uh, um, cupcakes and, twi you know, pinpacks. So we would get these packaged foods that, you know, had all kinds of crazy ingredient right. lists now. And, you know, the beauty is in today's world, my kids can get these remarkably healthy cupcakes. I mean, not totally healthy, but have real Healthier. ingredients <laughs> instead of, you know, an ingredient list that's 40 right, things that you long. you can't pronounce. Um, so it, it's a different world, luckily, that we live in today. So do you, uh, do you subscribe to a healthier lifestyle as far as your diet and exercise? And yeah, I mean, uh, I do exercise. I try to do it every day. I do yoga, Pilates, play tennis. Again, I'm not, I don't love yoga, but it right. works, and I respect it. And part of what I think is important is to do things that you're uncomfortable with, not just the things you love. Um, we eat a healthy diet. Um, you know, our family kind of decides the meals for the week. I certainly have my times when I eat things that are not as healthy. You know, when was the last time you ate a cheeseburger? Oh, my son and I went to In-N-Out a couple weeks ago. Oh, you and did. Well, you, when you're, you, you, know, you live right there. You have to. You just have to. Um, and yeah, you know, the key is moderation. Right. Um, you know, it's very hard in L.A. not to go to In-N-Out once in a while. You're very involved in, in Washington these days. Can you elaborate on that? You, my job is not to choose a party or a candidate, but it's to push for progress. And so about a year ago, I was in Davos, the World Economic Forum, and was with Vice President Biden when he announced his cancer moonshot. And to have someone like that, who's one of the most powerful people in Washington, you know, push and help advance our field it is truly tremendous. He gets it. He realizes that he's not going to cure cancer. And the word moonshot is a little bit of an exaggeration, but he can take away obstacles. So something that would have taken five years may take two and a half years now. And so we've certainly been privileged to be involved in pushing for the cures bill, you know, helping what's going to be four billion dollars over the next decade for cancer, for the brain, and for personalized medicine. And so we've been pushing in that regard. And they may be pushing the new administration, hopefully to choose people who can really make a difference and who can rise above politics. You know, the beauty or the sad part is, is that cancer, Alzheimer's, heart disease are not partisan issues, they're human issues. And so health and food represent almost 29% of the U.S. economy. And yet we've had very little leadership. And so my job is to push, whether it be whatever party, whoever it is, to really make the right decisions and to educate them about this. I mean, it makes no sense. It's Democrat versus Republican. It's all of us pushing for each other. Cancer hits every family. Alzheimer's hits every family. And so we have to push for progress so we can all benefit. And so politicians can be remarkable people when they do the right thing. It's my job to educate them, because I believe if they're educated, they will. So now that the bill is passed, what now? President uh, Obama signs it on Tuesday. And so we're going to have more resources and at the same time have a push to do things hopefully more expeditious. You know, these resources are controlled by people like the head of the National Cancer Institute. So I want and I'm pushing for somebody who's really innovative and can be out of the box to make a difference. Um, we really need that leadership sorely. You know, the greatest healthcare leader over the last decade is the former mayor of New York City, Mayor Bloomberg, who got out there and he said, no trans fats, no large sodas. And he was fantastic. But when the greatest leader is the former mayor of New York City, you know there's a problem in our field. We have to push for better and stronger leadership. 
Has anybody ever told you that there's a slight resemblance between the two of you? Between Mayor Bloomberg yes, and I? Yes, a younger version, a lot of younger no. version, but there's a slight resemblance, I have to say. Uh, just getting back to the Cures Bill, is there any concern at all because of the change in hands of administration and the new cabinet that the money won't be disseminated in a, pl in a way or in a fashion that you would like to see it done? I, I don't think so. Okay. I think that the new administration, really on the science, the health and medicine side, is going to get it. Okay. Um, and I'm really hoping so. And we certainly have had talks um, with them, as with both parties, really pushing them in the right direction. And, you know, it's very hard to be against what we and my fellow scientists do, which is push for change and push for cures and push for new ways of thinking about things. But getting back to your family. Yes. So do you often travel with them? Do you get to get out of L.A. much other than your, your speaking engagements? And yeah. And so, you know, since I was, you know, started when my kids were young, I take them on trips with me. So all over the world, you know, our kids have been and been exposed and people. And, you know, we bring them, whenever I have dinners, they're there. And so they're there in the conversations. And, you, you know, to me, you know, I don't want to wait till they grow up to have them join right. this conversation. I want them to start at an early age. And I still remember being with, you know, one of the titans of Silicon Valley just several months ago. And he got in a political fight with my son. And they're screaming at each other. And this guy, one of the smartest guys there is, could have easily ignored a 16-year-old I took him seriously because he knew that that conversation would give him, you know, strength to have future conversations, and I love that. And so, you know, there's a great story um, when Kennedy said we're going to put a man on the moon. People thought he was crazy and said, you know, how can we really make this audacious goal? Is this really where we should put our national resources? Well, nine years later, Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon. The average age in missile command when Armstrong stepped on the moon was 27, which means those kids were 18 years old. So, no offense, you and I aren't going to be the savior for the next generation. We're not going to solve the problems of disease for the next generation. Our kids are. And so it's our job to make them excited and passionate about science, to make them excited and passionate about making a difference. Other than yourself and your wife, who inspires your children? Um, you know, they have a long list, you know, luckily. Um, you know, Larry Ellison, who's been mm. remarkable to me in terms of philanthropy, you know, again, has given my kids, you know, a beacon that you can do good in the world. You know, friends of ours, you know, and that we've been involved with, from Steve Jobs to Mark Benioff, you know, my kids have been privileged to interact with them and really have them as role models and realizing that the reason you fork companies is not just to make a product or to right. make money, but it's to help your community and give back. And I think they get to see it in what those other people do and how they talk, and it really makes a difference. What are they interested in? Besides um, the science and um, engineering? You know, my, my daughter wants to apply math to problems. And so whether they be problems, you know, in marketing, in science, in medicine, you know, I think she's going to be an entrepreneur and innovator. My son now is into robotics. Um, and it's the fun thing to watch is they right. build something, he and his friends, and they program it. You know, I learned programming. It was very simple when I learned it, Fortran. Now they're learning these crazy complex languages and can do things right. that back then would have taken teams of people to do. So it's amazing to watch. You're lighting up again. It's a wonderful, inspiring thing to see. So. Well, thank you. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us. I know your keynote is going to be absolutely thought-provoking and powerful, and I'm looking forward to hearing it. Well, thank you. It's a privilege. Well, thank you.